Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation for both of the IE and uh, IEO. Actually, this is the first time visiting the IE office. It looks brand new, it looks very nice. And 3 of course, uh, I've, uh, I've been 3 for quite a long time. And it's great to see this getting, to, getting together to have this joint seminar series. Particularly with Unrega, where I think there's you know, been lots of discussion about Unrega, what's happening to it, whether there will be, what will happen to it in the future. And I think a lot of things we wanted to take in from this particular project, and I'm going to try and summarize six papers in about 25 minutes, um, is to try and sort of tell you that, look, it's important to understand, obviously, the impact on Unrega, and that's been lots of the focus has been on that. Samiksha, um, there's a whole bunch of papers that came out with Samiksha by MORG, which is kind of a very good competition on the paper. But before we get to the, event, the impact of it, we want to understand why is it not working, or working well, in certain, in certain states, in certain kind of contexts. And I'm going to try and show to you the role of politics, okay? Uh, the dirty word, politics. So I'm going to try and take you to, to different ways of how we look at it. So I'm very fortunate, all I've done really is to try and summarize papers that my colleagues have done. There's only one paper and sort of, uh, the two people join being involved. Others are the rather colleagues of mine, many of them you know very well. Um, so I'm just trying to summarize the papers that we've done in this particular project. And just very quickly taking through the kind of basics of this, we all have know the, what is going on in Rega. There's a sense there's a crisis going on in Unrega. Whether it's too strong a word or not, we don't know. But we know, for example, over the last few years, there's been a drop in outlay as opposed to GDP, financial outlay, household coverage has gone down from 50, 50, 55 million to about 30 million uh, the last financial year. Average days were all this are showing downward trends. Um, and also, the other puzzle, puzzle people keep on talking about that Amrika hasn't seemed to have done well as far as providing employment in the poorest, poorer states. So states like uh, Bihar, uh, Chhatkar, Madhya Pradesh haven't done as well in providing Anrega. I mean, using things like number of households have completed 100 days or 100 days work. Doesn't really matter to look at the use. You generally see this pattern. It's been commented, commented on by a lot of other people. Now, of course, even if you control for so-called demand side factors, uh, because obviously it's a, you know, it's a demand side program. So if you do as a quick, quick kind of a crude way of doing this, divide by the number of poor in each state, you still you see a very clear difference in. Some states have done very well, relatively speaking, in providing unregulated employment. Himachal Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, this is more, more like old, older data, but Rajasthan doesn't seem to do so well recently. And then even Chhattisgarh uh, are all seen as successful states. And then, of course, you have states at the bottom uh, Bihar, Punjab, probably not so important there, Maharashtra, Assam, Haryana, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, and so on. So you see this very clear successful states and, and uh, not so successful states, and we use this as a selection criteria for a, for a state level case study analysis, because we use this criteria to say which states we think are successful, which are not, and try and see the differences. Um, Some sharp variation within states are also, whichever in the analysis you use, blocks, districts, GPs, this is Andhra Pradesh, which is actually one of the most successful states, we see sharp variation, and that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, well known. But the thing is, of course, that you could say in principle the demand side nature of Unrega uh, and its common design should really not allow for implementation variation of that significance. Of course, you would expect to see variation implementation across states within states, but not at the, not at the level of magnitude we're seeing right now. And so we need to understand that, both across states in India and within states. And we're going to try and address this puzzle through a political economy lens, so understand the role of politics influencing this. Um, the three core questions that all of us had to kind of tangle with in this set, several papers, we, the first question was what, what capacity the states have to deliver successful implementation on Rega. When I said state, I mean sub-national state, so state level governments and local, and local level governments. Um, the commitment of, of state agencies and political elites to Unrega implementation and what are the political feedback effects on Rega implementation. The third question is actually quite important. I'm surprised that in India it's not discussed very well. If you look at, for example, Latin American experience with uh, Bolsa Familia, with Progress, uh, one of the things we learned from those, thing, from those uh, from the work there is there was some very strong political feedback effects in positive. In other words, mayors who implemented Bolsa Familia well tended to get re-election, higher reaction properties, and often you see that in the first term they implemented Bolsa Familia well, second term they got the, the, the payoff and they were re-elected. So you need to understand exactly, is that happening in India? Do we really expect to see that and if it's happening, where is it happening? So we are very interested in looking at political feedback effects. The reason, of course, we, we do think that we see strong positive political feedback effects, it makes UNREGA's implementation self-sustainable. If political elites see a benefit in implementing UNREGA 
properly, then you expect to see a thing in a good equilibrium kind of situation where you keep on implementing it properly. So it's important to understand that. And obviously, if you have negative feedback effects, then obviously, you know, we've expected to implement it very well. Um, so what I want to try and summarize is about six papers in these four projects. One by Deepta, and I played a kind of a minor role in this, looking at capacity government implementation across eight states. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about that paper, about that paper but I really want to focus on some sub-state issues. Abhiru Pengangshu looked at within, within Panchayat Samitis and GPs, and understand also across Panchayat Samitis and GPs. Uh, the two papers they have, I'm going to summarize uh, both of them very quickly. Indrajit Roy looked at villages in the analysis in Bihar and Gujarat, two villages in Bihar, two villages in Gujarat. Uh, and the Shubhashish has done a, a, a paper, this is a case student of mine, looking at Kram Shamshad's in West Bengal. So several papers, a different this analysis. We are very keen to, sorry, we are very keen to use mixed methods. We were, so for example, Deepta and Indigenous papers are all using uh, for, uh, case uh, quantitative methods, interviews, uh, ethnographic methods and so on. Abhiru, Himangshu, Shubhashish's papers are using quant methods. So we wanted to use different methods because we do think that's the best way to think about any kind of uh, any kind of work of this kind. Also, we are very keen to use different use analysis, GPs, blocks, districts, states. Okay, so we are very keen to work at different levels of analysis, and that was why we used we, we, we were trying to try to use different states. Uh, we tried to compare across and within states in almost every work. So I'm, I'm very compared. We're trying to be comparative as much as possible. Can, uh, right. Sorry. Sorry. Could I just ask a really, really um, painful question? What is the Panchayat Samiti? District, what... the district Panchayat. Yeah, the district Panchayat. Um, before I get into the specific papers, here's a paper that Himangshu and Abhirubal has written, which I just want to kind of flag this because I think there's a big question now. If you're seeing Anrega's outcomes falling, is it just people just don't want it Anrega anymore? Is it just because there are other stuff, other things happening outside the uh, uh, outside Anrega in terms, particularly in terms of uh, off-farm work. So is Anrega, uh, is Anrega demand falling over time? So this is an important question we have to kind of address. So Abhirupa and Himangshu, what they did in Rajasthan is they actually did some service of, of uh, villages, particularly poor villages, um, and asked them the question like about, do you really want Anrega work? And if you're not getting Anrega work, why is that? So for example, the question they asked, is it demand constraint, not demand constraint? The first question is like, is it why, you know, if you're not getting unregular work, what is the reason? And basically, the lot of times the argument was it was because it was demand constraint. And then you start getting into more specific details why, when do houses get work? So they asked them, asked the villagers, when, 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 they, when do they get work? And you can see that it's mostly when there is an average of projects along with when they demand work. Obviously, if they demand work, if it's only if they demand work, they will get work. But it's interesting that about half of the villagers that they asked said that they only get work pretty much when they want work, but when there is a project around. And that's interesting. Um, and then, so the question then, of course, the natural question is that if you want to work and you're not getting work, did you demand more work? Did you go and tell your sarpanch that you wanted to work? Um, and what happened there? And of course, most of them said, yes, we wanted to work and we demanded more work. We wanted more work, we demanded more work. And then the question then was, then why did you not get this work? What happened? And the answer that came about was really very interesting. The big answer was that um, either the Sarpanch did not favor the village, this is Rajasthan, mm -hmm. okay, multi village Sarpanches, or multi village Panchayats, right? So the one key reason was Sarpanch was not from my village, the Sarpanch was not interested in getting work to my village, okay? The other thing that came across is that the Sarpanch said to us that the Sarpanch doesn't have any, any money, there are no products, okay? So that was a very clear answer that was going on. Um, and it was not so much because of other demand side factors. So very first thing, first thing is important here. Clearly, we're seeing something's happening when you have multi-village franchise and Sarpan is not from your village. Okay, that's very clear at least in Rajasthan. Second is Sarpan saying, well, pretty much I don't have any any projects around, so there's no work, right? Um, and so then they'll be asked and asked again. The question is, why did you not request work? You know, you wanted work. You didn't get it. Why do you not sort of make your demand much more clearer? And the answer was, the majority of them said, the villagers were told they will get work whenever they sign work. Okay? Now this is something I think is an interesting thing that's coming out now. This is just one state, and this is, oh, this is a survey of uh, about 2,000 villagers in different villages in Pakistan. 
But the point here that's interesting here is it's going to discourage village or even discourage worker effect. You go to the sarpanch once, twice, sarpanch says, sorry, no work. Then how many more times are you going to go and ask for work? And this interesting thing is happening here that might explain why we are beginning to see some tailing off on regular work if this discouraged work effect becomes self fulfilling Okay? Uh, or even a self uh, discouraged village effect. Sometimes the whole village is getting pressured out of work. Okay? So that was something that was interesting. So now let's move on to looking at our specific papers. First, Deepta's paper. Deepta, what she wanted to do was look at four different states in India and try and understand exactly what the role of political commitment was. Now this is tricky. When you say political commitment, it's often difficult to know exactly what exactly we mean by that. And I'll show you how to try to operationalize that. But just very quickly, the four states, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Bihar, Rajasthan, sorry, five, so Rajasthan. And we have states with, with obviously, we had, we had the Congress government, the BJP government. We also had a state Rajasthan switched governments in the time that she was doing interviews. And there was Bihar with the, with the, with the uh, uh, regional government. Um, and of course, you could sort of sort of say, okay, you know, if it's a UPA UPA led government, it's more likely that Andhra will implement it proper, properly. We didn't really say that. So if you expect performance to be high on Pradesh, it was actually high. So that that was uh, that was there. In Chhattisgarh, you'd expect performance to be not so high, low, but it was pretty high. Assam, you'd expect performance to be high, it was low. Bihar, you'd expect performance to be low, it was low, and so on. And Rajasthan was very interesting. It was high. You expect it to be high to low to high. It was just opposite, exactly the opposite. It was low to high to low. In other words, under, under the uh, under the Kerala administration, under the implementation kind of tailed up into it. So, so there's interesting stories here, which I said, see that right away, you can't sort of say it's to do with the political regime in power. So, so what did Deepa try and do was she tried to sort of think through how do we actually observe political commitment or measure it, if you wish. Um, and what she did is she used a particular schema that's been popular by Derek Birkenhoff, who works on this kind of issues. Um, and the sixth thing that she had was uh, one was the locus of initiative pull up policy implementation effect. First, I'm going to explain this in a minute in the, when we look at the actual states. Degree of to rigor, better understanding in cause of cause of implementation failure. Do we really see an understanding in the state bureaucracy and how, why there was implementation failure? What did they try to, to resolve that? How do we mobilize constituents of stakeholders in support of policy implementation, particularly civil society, civil society actors? What are credible sanctions in support of implementation objectives? We saw non performing BGO or non performing uh, 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 district magistrate. What are the mechanisms of sanctioning those people? Do we see continued effort in implementing policy across regimes, or even across different, uh, different uh, principal secretaries at the state level? And also, what do powerholders feel about political feedback mechanisms? What do they think they gain from implementing a proper and complex table? But basically what she finds is that she finds very clear, I mean, so Chhattisgarh, for example, she finds one of the things that it was interesting was there was a very strong sense of high political feedback, positive political feedback. So the regime in, in, in Chhattisgarh sort of felt there was a need to implement Andrega very, very clearly, very clear, very well, because it saw something very, to be gained from political, from, from doing that properly. So you can see then again, for example, in. Um, if you, know, for, if you look at the Chhattisgarh story, which is quite interesting, you see even though Chhattisgarh doesn't do very well in every aspect of, of commitment, it does well in, in most of them. Okay? Now this is interesting, because Chhattisgarh is seen as a low capacity state. Mm -hmm. And Chhattisgarh is unusual in, in actually doing America properly. Assam is just opposite. Assam actually has pretty much low in almost every dimension of commitment. Right? And Assam, of course, is a state where you know Andrega has not been permitted very well, and, is, and in Dikta's assessment, very low as a commitment of the political elite at different levels to Andrega. Andhra Pradesh is an obvious story we know very well. It's high on through. Bihar is interesting because Bihar, we have, again, variations of commitment in different, in different measures, but on the whole in Bihar, we have no political commitment. So the story that, get, that Dikta gets from, from, this, from this work, which is basically doing key, 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 interview, key informal interviews with different, different stakeholders at different levels, you get to see quite different kinds of commitment levels in different dimensions in the states. And, they, and she would argue that this has a correlation with actual outcomes that you see. So just to summarize her findings, she finds that commitment capacity are very critical to policy implementation outcomes. That's pretty obvious, I think. And they intersect with each other. In other words, we tend to see high capacity states like Andhra Pradesh also seeing strong political commitment both of the, of, the, of the political elites but also of the bureaucracy. Low capacity states is only one state in, in which has done well in terms of Andrega, the Chhattisgarh. You seem to see that the state can sort of fight against this obvious disadvantage with low capacity with, with strong political commitment. 
And she also finds, I think, from her Rajasthan work, that coming to the dynamic concept, it seems to change with different events, different actors, and different circumstances. Um, and of course, the final thing I think she would like to highlight, she would like to highlight, is a way to handle this issue is not through kind of more and more rule-based measure public ways of implementing Anrega. You've got to really understand what is it that actually makes political elites interested in Anrega, and why do we seem to see that varying across these different states, and why do we seem to see it varying for a given stage like Rajasthan over time? That's something we need to understand. Going on from state to village is a paper in Rajit Blog, which I think is very interesting because it does it in a different way than I've seen other, other, other work on this. What Indrajit does is that he takes two states in India, Bihar and Gujarat. Gujarat is a good story in terms of, you know, the standard stories about uh, administrative outcomes, and Bihar is usually the bad story. And what he does is that he takes two villages in Bihar, he calls B1 and B2, there's one real identity, Gujarat, G1 and G2, and he tries to understand variation in Bihar between B1 and B2 village. And, and Gujarat G1 G2 village, and he purposely selects his villages very carefully, and, I, and I'll explain in a minute. He selects uh, uh, two blocks, in Bihar, uh, two blocks, Pargama in Bihar, Patan Bairava in Gujarat. Within that, you have two villages, B1 and B2. B1, by and large, does very well in unregular implementation. B2 doesn't do so well. So, for example, you can see B1, by and large, is, you know, government outcomes are by and large greater than the block average, uh, B2 lower than the block average. Same thing, G1 does better in implementation than G2. Question is, can we relate this difference in implementation, even within a state, in two villages, in the same, uh, same block, to political variables? And here's the way he tries to think through it. He argues that actually one of the things we want to understand is that who is the world the people who are hiring on labor factors to work? These are mostly agricultural laborers and marginal farmers. Who are the people who actually employ this kind of labor in, the pri in private farms? This is small and medium and large farmers. And if you could understand exactly how Anrega actually works at the village level, you could understand both where the demand for work coming in and on the other side, those who supply the work to them through, uh, through, uh, through an Anrega. So you could to understand exactly that. And the thing that's important, that is interesting in Anrega's work, he says that the way think it plays out is actually the way agriculture labor with marginal farmers forge coalitions with small, medium, and large farmers. In other words, the Andrega's definition is very much the way it plays in the village level, is the way local level of politics works, and the way coalitions are formed between, between those who want to work and those who can probably control the supply of work. So, how does it work out? So, in, in Indigenous framework, there are two kinds of elites who, can, who are to work there. The, the first is the, the, are the rich farmers who combine agriculture incomes with profits in retail, realistic labor contracting, uh, usually for large or medium farmer, upper class backgrounds. Um, with somebody in the bureaucracy or corporate sector, then in the, what he calls the precarious elite, who have a limited profits on agriculture, and this is typically small farmers, intermediate caste background, or retailers, immigrant, immigrant upper caste background. Question therefore is that when you think about unregulated implementation at the village level, who sets the who sets the agenda for, for the politics in that village? That's the question. Is it this guys here, or is it this guys here? Both are both are groups who are in the elite class. Both are actually a situation where they might be demanding agriculture workers in their fields, but exactly how it plays out depends very much on whether this is the side of How exactly? So think about really uh, are agricultural laborers in alliance with each of these elites at the village level? Right? Who are the agricultural workers are able to form alliances with? And also, which of these groups are able to set identity for the local level politics? Those two things are the crucial variables here. How does this work? So imagine then there are two kinds of possibilities of coalition. The farmers, the, uh, the laborers can form an alliance with the elites, or they can be isolation of the elites, they have no link with the elites. And on the, on the other side, you have entrant elites, the ones who are the rich farmers, who can, who can either form an alliance with agricultural laborers, he calls it an alliance, incorporative settlement, or you have a precarious elite who forms an alliance with the, with the agricultural laborers, he calls it an egalitarian settlement, because you have both small farmers and with, uh, agricultural laborers forming an alliance. Same time, you can have entry elites who are not really forming an alliance with agricultural workers and who essentially use unreg or any other mechanism at the village level to distribute rents to agricultural workers. That we call patronage. And finally, you have a situation where you have precarious elite who are actually not in alliance with the agricultural workers, they call them cleave settlements. And he's, he argues this is really based on. A lot of, he spent, he spent about a year in a business villages um, doing what he called ethnographic hanging out. Um, you can see very clearly that you expect that this kind of, um, this kind of 
Oh, this kind of alliance with an interest elite can actually be better than the implementation. That's not the conclusion. But, so let me just repeat that. His argument is, and I, let me just actually put up the argument here. His argument is, if Anchorage elites control the local government, they are very low interest in making not make a regular work farm. Because they don't really demand work, agricultural workers in their farms. They have other interests going on, they have non-farm income, so on. They have very little interest in not making a regular work property. So if they feel that they need to get agricultural workers in an alliance against the precarious elites, then they will actually make a regular work property. So the strange thing here is, you have a very strange situation where the larders of the landowners might actually have an interest in making a regular work properly when they see a clear, clear kind of a political win while linking up with the agricultural workers. That's unusual. That happens in, Gujar in the Gujarat village that he, that he looks at. Right? So here, because unregal work is not creating a threat to these farmers, they just don't, they don't, they, their interest is, can I get this agriculture workers on my side? The way I do that is actually making sure they to prevent the farm. That is a very interesting situation. Right? Now, on the other, another possible way it happens is when small farmers and agricultural workers see a common class, common interest. And then they, and here what essentially is happening is that the precarious elites, which are small and marginal, marginal farmers, are essentially forming alliances with agricultural workers to try and block the power of the large landowners. And obviously, you can imagine this is happening in this example in Bihar. So, in this case, you can see small and marginal farmers linking up with agricultural workers. And here, obviously, the interest is to make unregal work because they need the support of the, of the, of the agricultural workers. And here they're trying to get, go against the power of the, of the, of the landed farmers. And that's, again, a very interesting way the unregal's worked. On the other hand, two bad kind of examples of unregal were not working properly is when basically precarious elites really, when entity elites are essentially interested in patronage networks where they don't see any benefit, political benefit of linking up agricultural workers. In this case, agricultural workers are isolation from the landed, landed farmers, and they're very really interested in that, and they're much more in, they're much more in a situation where America is not involved to them. So that's very really interesting. So we have in Bihar a sec the second village here, what is what the calls a, a patronage-based political settlement. Finally, oops, sorry. Um, finally, other finally in Gujarat, the second village, you have entrance elites who are out of the out of the villages borders, the country towns. Precarious elites are, have power to that in the locality, but they don't want to bring in Andreka because they are, in, they are worried about labor shortages. So there's a clear political settlement, and therefore there's no kind of unity among the small farmers or the agricultural, work, agricultural workers to actually bring in Andreka property. But this story is a very different story from what you hear about Andreka. It's telling us we've got to understand local power relations and limit of what political policy works, and understand why Andreka is not doing so well in some conflicts in some villages. So, uh, Ibrahim just says a few things for policy, and I'm going to, leave, I'm going to move on very quickly to the next presentation. He says we're going to form in middle bottom alliances, we're going to work politically with, with the, middle, the, 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 the middle groups. We've got to also perhaps think of allowing Andrega work with private farms and medium farmers to get interested in, in Andrega implementation, because the problem really is in his, in, that you don't see that we're interested in, in many cases. Perhaps he could have nearly poor in the pro poor interventions, think of more universal inclusive services, so that's probably the more. small. You know, I, I mean, that's not sure it's what it follows from this work, but essentially the ar argument here is to think more creatively around what are the political blockages implementation and try and work around that. That's a very different take. So the next thing I will turn to now, I've shown you the Kuala work, and I've shown you that at the state and, and, the, and the micro and the village level, they get very interesting stories about how political commitment and plays out in, in, in different contexts. Now I want to take you to more quant work, and I want to try and answer this question. Does, does party affiliation matter in spending on regular outcomes? That's a very clear kind of question economists can kind of think about and use electoral data and election data. And I also want to show, uh, try and think, make you think through that under what context does it matter? Not only the, not only the party affiliation matters, under what context does it matter? And the other thing that, that you have a particular interest in, what are the political feedback effects of unregular implementation? Does it really matter to edits to do it properly? Or can we see some benefits of that? So, this is a paper that uh, Shubhashish and I think is still now writing together on West Bengal. Um, I would just expect you West Bengal the way West Bengal elections are held at the Panchayat level. I think maybe it's not, it's, you know, it's certainly not the case in, in many other states. So in West Bengal what happens is that you have different villages with the called Ramshangshats or wards. 
and they elect a particular political, as you know, West Bengal elections are fought on party lines, right? Where you know they may be few independent, but by and large, most of their political affiliations. And then they elect somebody up to the village, village council, the panchayat. And then, depending on how many were elected from a particular party, they get to form, they get to elect the nominate the, the sovereign. Okay? So that means that it's become very important, therefore, in West Bengal to win these wards. If you have 10 wards in the panchayat, you win 6, then you get to nominate your sarpanch and you get to, this, this, uh, uh, you get to uh, control that question resources in all your wards. Very important, right? To try and win these uh, wards. And um, obviously there may be five fives or something like that, and then of course there are ways to resolve that. But by and large, we sit and see wards where one party wins or the other party wins. And obviously in, this, in the Venezuela case, uh, it's mostly the Trinamool Congress and the other left parties. Okay, so we chose three different uh, districts, Purulia, where there's a, there was a left government in 2008 at the local level, I mean. And then, uh, then we have Trinamool Congress, we call it Trinamool Congress, right populist here. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we disagree with that. South Pagan is, South Pagan is right. Uh, Thinabur both votes elections, but had elections here, not, not any other election. Jalpaiguri is left in both cases. Jalpaiguri is unusual because by and large, you know, left has lost control of most panchayats. It's one of the very few places where left is still in, in charge. Okay, um, very quickly, we've got a lot of data here. We've got 569 villages, uh, over 49 village, village council. We've got detailed village level rainfall data. Um, so we to try and control demand side factors. And so I also, the other thing that uh, we did, we got this surveys of 569 wards, villages, uh, and we got data on NRU's implementation at the village level. As you know, that is not available otherwise. Panchayats collect data on their own panchayat, but with the village level, it is very difficult to get. So we went to villages, we collected NRU's expenditures and so on for the villages. Uh, and then we mapped it to the other things. Okay, so basically we have three years panel data. And we have election year 2008 and election year 2013. So we have a nice way to look at things happening over time. Very quickly here, um, the main thing here, as you know now already, that in West Bengal there was this big shift when the, the left had 56% of seats, it was on 8, and now they're 34.8. Big shift towards the Rainbow Congress, which is now about 49% of seats. And so we are able to actually see big changes going on in this panchayats. Uh, the other interesting thing is if we look at energy expenditure for each or when the, G, the, when the GP board, the ground project board is GMC, or when it's left, you tend to see that uh, in the Trinamool Congress boards, the Trinamool Form Congress nominates the Sarpanch, they tend to spend more in their own wards, where the wards where they have, have, have people, their own uh, members elected from. Same thing to the left. But we don't really know because simply trying to capture something else. So we need to be much more careful about this. I'm going to now try and take you through a way to try and think about this. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are into this uh, in, in, into identification here, so I'll quickly go through this. Basically, we're trying to do fuzzy regression country design. What we have to capture is when does somebody get elected in a particular ward? Now, usually, if it's 51% or 50 points, then obviously that person is elected. But in West Bengal, you have Congress, left, Trinamool, BJP to some extent, and a few other parties. So you can get to become elected even with less than 50 percent. So we have to use fuzzy, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy RDD because you can even get elected with 35 percent of votes. Okay, so you need to capture that. So basically, what you're going to try and do very, very simple. We're going to have an outcome variable in our expenditure by village. We have uh, a treatment. We're going to try and capture the treatment effect of somebody becoming the one member becoming the ruling party in that board and see whether that makes a difference in where the particular uh, GP spends the money, which wants. Okay? And I get when I get to the result, it will become easier. This is an important thing. Just forget about this side, this is a more complicated. What you really find is that the moment you hit 50% in a particular ward, of course you're going to form you're going to form the you're going to win. Right? But you can even win even when you are even so you can see the big jump here. So in West Bengal, even if you get around 22% of a vote in specific wards, you can win. Okay? And obviously the probability of winning increases as you get 50%. So that's why we're going to capture the fact that even for though, for even as though Leo has 25% of vote, vote share, it's quite possible to win. Which is why we need the fuzzy regression design to capture that. Okay? And so you can see that 
well, uh, for somebody who hits, hits a fortune, 50% is pretty much sure the person will win, but you also see increases in, in probably winning as you move from 20% to 50%. That's pretty clear. Okay, now this is telling us that um, what about expenditures, right? This is really interesting because you can see from here, sorry, it's easier to show this way. You can see the moment you win an award, right? You got, and particularly the 50% level, you see a big jump in expenditures. In other words, you see that GP boards target particular awards where they just are at the margin. Okay? The interesting thing is, if you happen to be winning like almost 100% of the votes, expenditures are dropping off. So you're really thinking strategically as in, in, in a part, you're thinking, where can I win a seat? I need to make sure I get the majority of awards in my Panchayat to become the Sarpanch from the, from the government, and I'm really targeting this group here who I think I can pursue it. Right? Yep. So I missed something. Now, why are we are reporting late over here instead of ATT? On two slides, if you go. Uh, yeah. Local average. It's local, local average. She's asking why you're reporting the local average. You're still writing something over average. here. Yeah, no, this is. So local average is, is the probability that if you, if you are. Uh, if you win the this thing, what right? The problem they're finna bring winning part, winning win on an RNG expenditure. So that's why, right? So that's why we're showing it uh, here, right? So here we can see again. Forget these two sides. You can see this big jump that happens and then tails off. Okay. So that's interesting. There's a question you might ask: This big jump is happening. Is it true for both left and Trinamool Congress? And here's a surprising result. If you're left, if you're a left party, you are not interested in the strategy. Okay, now that's something you have to think, why is that happening? Okay? If you're a left party, of course, as you go to 50% you're going to win, but you just do not see any kink. Okay? And that's something very surprising. So left parties do not strategically allocate, when they win a vote, they don't actually allocate money towards awards where they have a kind of a 50%, you know, where the vote share is just about the 50%. Vote. Okay? So that's really interesting. On the other hand, Tinamool does a big, there's a big increase, there's a very big increase with Tinamool Congress. Tinamool strategically looks at wards where they are, in, in, where they might lose, and there's, in the next election, they strategically increase expenditures, energy expenditures to that particular ward. So there's a big difference in left and, and, and Tinamool. Now, we, we haven't yet figured out what the reasons are, that's kind of context, but it's a kind of interesting difference. Now, the first question, therefore, the one thing I'd say that, why, what, what is the payoff here? Does it really matter? Well, yes, there's a big payoff. So first of all, let me show you the results. So forget about this here. You can see ruling party, big jump in energy expenditures to the ward. Left is actually negative, not significant. At Tinamur, it's a huge, big effect. This is in real rupees. There's a huge effect, increased expenditures to wards in the Tinamur is really fighting for, fighting for a space. Okay? Left, there's no effect. Okay? So that is very interesting. And then, then the question is, are there positive or negative feedback effects? The interesting thing is that when you, in 2008 election, 2013 election, we have, so if you look at board share, again, the interesting thing is that there's a jump for all, all ruling parties and board share the next election. For the left, they actually get penalized. This might explain to some extent what happened in, in, in West Bengal. They get penalized by not favoring their own votes. But with Tinamur, it's a big jump in re election power. Okay, it does a board share. So what is interesting in this story is that there seems to be, and again, like I said, this is basically data that is very difficult to get. So I don't know whether it applies to other states. Also, West Bengal's election, the way the GP elections happen is very, very unique, I think. So it's a bit difficult to see how it's happening in other states. So I'll show the other side also that didn't able to find a similar kind of story in a different, different way. But the interesting story here is that you seem to see the way intervention happens very much conditioned by political variables. And we simply see certain political parties using RHG, in RHGs in a very strategic way, and that seems to pay off in this case, in the case of Tinamul. Okay? Now you might ask, well, why is the left not really realizing this? That's a different question. You might say the left is problematic as a party hasn't really looked at. This is basically nothing but characterist behavior. They really haven't gone to characterism. There are many ways to speculate why the left has not done this. But whatever the reasons are, at least in the West Bengal context, you see very interesting implementation dynamics 
lead to political effects, political bad effects. Okay, I'm going to just very quickly. Uh, so again, same thing. Left, there is actually declining vote share in the wards where they compete against Tinubu, while the Tinubu sees a big chunk in vote share. Okay, so that's that's pretty clear. So anyway, Overloop's point is now coming to Rajasthan, looking at INC versus BJP, uh, Congress versus BJP, and again in, in the case of Rajasthan, he finds that in the in the district panchayats, he finds that. Congress seems to very strategically go for the ones where they are just about at the 40, 45, 50% level. So they actually, you can see the big tail-off in expenditure from benchmark funds. So they are, if, in areas where they are really dominant, they are not really interested in spending. When areas where they are so seriously disadvantaged, they have no chance of winning, they also are not interested in spending. They are not, uh, not spending, just in spending, they are not I think, at the, at the, at the block level. So it's only here that Abhiru finds that, and Abhiru also finds BJP don't seem to be doing this, but speculation here we have that BJP at that time didn't really have too many district panchayats under their control. So maybe they didn't feel there was anything, any political games by playing this kind of game, this kind of thing. Um, and also closely, so whenever there are close elections, Tinabul, uh, sorry, Tinabul Congress actually plays a very strategic thing here by increasing funds wherever the vote share was lower in close, in close count elections. Uh, and he finds also there is a political feedback effect happening to INC vote share, which is not really in terms of actually vote, vote share increase in the next election. So that's interesting. I mean, so in the case of Rajasthan, it seems, it seems to be Congress who are doing this very strategic allocation funds, looking at where they are competing. In the case of West Bengal, since the Tinubu Congress, but we see different parties doing it different ways. All right, so let me just finish now. Um, so I think the one thing I, w I think we want to say, say across all the papers is we seem to find, and maybe it's not surprising now if we know Anurega, Anurega's uh, work is driven mostly supply of work better, not the demand for it. So we really, the message one is going to get across is that whatever we see Anurega being implemented, not just the supply side dynamics, both from political factors, but also higher level, state level, political uh, capacity coming. So both lo uh, political at the local level through to uh, to the election and so on, but also the state level. So I think that's the one thing. And also the other thing that we find that there's been no single route to better Amrega intervention at the state level, different state different uh, different thing, which I think is a very good counterexample to a state that doesn't have high capacity, it's done pretty well, but different states use different mechanisms to implement better. And other states which haven't done very well, the clear problem has been, at least in the state level work we've done, done is the level of political commitment that, that is there across different domains. Um, so that's pretty clear from the state level work that, that we've done. And then at, the, at the lower level, at the, at the sub-state level, local level functionary is, is critical to outcomes. And the work we did show Dennis is, is doing suggests that we've got to really worry about local political dynamics. You really haven't paid attention to that. You've got to figure out exactly, maybe we've got a diagnostic of different, different villages, understanding who's in charge of the different councils, Understanding their interests and then understanding why is it that sometimes you see good implementation, not good implementation. Understanding that. I think it's very, very important. And also, the other thing that's probably a good thing from our work is that since the political competition do seem to have better, has positive uh, political feedback effects, but again, it's not clear yet why some parties seem to be interested in this, others are not. That is not clear to us. You might have argued that it shouldn't really depend on the political party in power. Everyone, everybody wants to win again. But we seem to see differences across political parties, we need to understand that. Recommendations very quickly. I, the main thing is that we, took, we think the supply has to be opened up rather than demanded. And we're going to think through how do we work with block and block panchayat functionaries who are, who are essentially acting as balls to direct funds and constituencies. We need to think through their incentives, their, their, the way they work, and try to open up <coughs> balls to get unregular work to whoever, whoever needs it. And other thing that I think the work that Himangsha and Uruk has done on Rajasthan suggests that we got to also better with capture demand at the village level. Because if you look at panchayat level data, you're missing something that is that even within the panchayat, Sarpanch is a very, very carefully strategic allocating resources to certain villages, particularly where they come from. So we're going to capture that demand side thing much better. I'm not sure about how we can leverage positive political feedback effects. Ultimately, it's, a, it's really up to politicians to see this to be something important for them. I don't know what we could do as from the policy side, but you know there may be things we can try and think about that. 
And also, I think the other thing is that to take away power from the local power holders, local elites, we're going to obviously strengthen civil society. That, that's very important because they're the ones who can challenge sometimes the local power, the power elites. And essentially, the, uh, the, the other thing, that last thing I want to say is perhaps kind of, you know, one could argue that we might just want to go back to the basics on Rega. This other thing we need to see and then work through how this might happen in a local level, state, at the state and local level, and work through different incentives that different players have in getting into work. Thanks.